Hello YouTube, this video is a continuation of the part one that I made about advice for tall and wide lifters to get thicker. And that was sort of a theoretical approach. Today I'm going to be mostly practical. I'm going to give you pointers, things to do, things, to do, things not to do when it comes to packing on mass as someone who is a bit of an outlier, either in terms of clavicular length or in terms of sheer height. So, in the previous video that was actually quite popular and you guys really liked it, I appreciate it, I mostly spoke about the mindset, how you're going to have to think about things. And most of what I'm going to say today is going to reiterate a lot of that, meaning that you have to keep in mind at all costs that the people who are giving you advice, mainly on YouTube fitness, are people who are standard, they are average. If you look at the average height of your random bodybuilder or powerlifter on YouTube fitness, they're between 5'7 and 5'10. They're not tall. They don't have any ideas of the challenges that you face. And in truth, I don't either, because I'm six feet. I'm tall-ish, right? I'm, I'm at the cutoff. But I can tell you that any inch you're going to gain above my height is going to be an extra slap of challenge in your face. And you're going to have to approach it with the mindset of someone who has to experiment a lot. Cookie cutter solutions will not make it for you. And for the most part, this is going to mean that you're going to have to go through a technical stage, an adaptation stage that is going to be longer. It might take someone who's 5'4 a few weeks to get and to, to integrate how to squat. It might take you much longer because for you, it's going to be a question of finding the one star that is not going to kill your lower back. It's going to take time, but it's worth it because it's an investment for the future. So never be aware, uh, never be afraid of getting going back, taking a step back, and reassessing the situation. If there is a lift that feels sketchy, don't be uh, don't be apprehensive about losing gains because you don't push heavy. It is much better to prepare yourself and to prevent a potential injury because the prevention might take three weeks, the curing of the injury might take three months. So always approach lifting, bodybuilding as an act of patience on your part. It's going to be longer for you, but that's okay because once you get to the level that is required for you to be big, you're going to be massive. So let's get to it. I want to start with, I think, the most important lifts for tall lifters, and that's going to be the squat and the deadlift, pause and knee flexions. If you lift, if you're on bodybuilding forums or channels, You've heard that you need to do those movements. They are the movements where you move the most weight and they're what's going to give you the most hypertrophy. And I 100% I agree with that. That being said, you are going to have to approach it differently. I have seen too many people give advice to tall lifters saying, oh, just do conventional, just do high bar. Uh, it, if it worked for me, it worked for you. Well, no, it doesn't. And high bar and conventional, sadly, are extremely tough to pull off for tall lifters for one reason. You, you guys tend to have lengthier torsos and that makes those two lifts very tough. It makes it tough for the conventional because it means that you have to bend forward a lot more to grab onto that bar. And it makes it tough for the squat because it means that it is more prevalent in tall lifters to experience certain amounts of lumbar rounding or even thoracic rounding for the most part that starts with the upper back and continues with the lower back. So, if you're the type of tall guy who can get those lifts done without getting any pain or any form breakdown, kudos to you, keep doing that. If you can, however, you're going to have to navigate around it. A lift that I really recommend tall lifters give a shot is the sumo deadlift. I know it's, it's not super appreciated in lifting circles, people say it's cheating. It's still a pull from the floor. There is a lot of difference from the conventional, but it's still a good hip hinge that focuses on the positive. And the beauty of it too is with the way you're built, you're going to have an ability to maintain a neutral spine when you do so. And that is going to be a lifesaver because you're still going to get a lot of work done from the sumo. Your armstrings, your glutes are going to get worked. The lower back less, but that's sort of a good thing for you because you're already going to work your lower back too much because if you think about it in terms of leverages, your head and the distance between your head and your hips tends to be bigger than an average person. And therefore, the torque in the lower back is also greater. 
So for you, anything that is going to allow you to save the lower back is money. So you're going to do sumo. And the beautiful thing with sumo too is that I have found personally that they tend to involve the glutes a lot. And that's great because a, a strong gluteus muscle for you is going to be a lifesaver. So you're going to do sumo. It doesn't mean you're only going to do sumo. I'm going to also advise you not to utilize sumo variations as your accessories because that is mainly what a powerlifter would do because they really want the carryover to the sumo to happen, but you don't. Your sumo is going to raise regardless. You don't have to worry about the carryover. And you, I would even say you don't really care about how strong you are on sumo. The sumo is just going to be your main pull from the floor. It's going to be your strength work. But most of the volume and the tonnage for the posterior chain will come from somewhere else. And that will come from variations of the conventional that are going to be more forgiving on the lower back. Mainly stiff leg deadlifts, because yes, a stiff leg done only in the positive because of your long torso is going to be extremely beneficial since you're going to have the ability to go and put your torso parallel to the floor, which is what a lot of tall people end up doing on the conventional anyways, but you're going to do it with sub-maximal weight, which is going to prevent the rounding of the lumbar spine, and you're going to pull with high hips, which is already what most people who are tall do regardless because they don't have the ability to pull with deep hips. So that's one. You can do Romanian deadlifts. Same logic. You'll be able to stop when you need to stop. And since you focus on the negative, you'll, you'll be able to control how much of a lumbar spine rounding happens. I would also highly recommend tall men, especially the ones who really don't want to give up on heavy conventionals, to do rack pulls or block pulls. Play around with it. Find the height that works for you and pull from there. You will find that even though you're not doing full range of motion, you're still getting a lot of arm strain and glute activation for the same reason I just described. You have a tendency to have your hips shoot up. Any lift that is going to allow you to not have that will involve a lot of leg drive. And so your posterior chain will get worked. As long as the bar is underneath the kneecaps, you will get some work. And that is what you need to be doing because it's going to prevent the lumbar spine from being the limiting factor. So find the right height and go with it. I'm also going to, and I'll talk about that later, but I highly encourage you to not be afraid of widening your stances. You are not me, for example. Me, I'm, I'm a lengthlet. I'm very, very narrow. I can go with a very strict narrow stance and close stance on the deadlift because I, I can get away with it and build for it. You might not be. If you have wide shoulders, don't grip near the smooth. Widen your hands. You might find that it's easier for you. Same for the legs. Don't hesitate to be a little bit wider. So that's for the deadlift. I, so again, I suggest sumo and then conventional variations that are going to allow you to use your legs. Because we want to grow the legs. It's the point of the, the hip hinge. In terms of variations that are not necessarily pulls, hyperextensions are going to be amazing for you. Reverse glute arm raises are going to be amazing for you. Don't hesitate to abuse them. Don't hesitate to reduce the amount of volume and tonnage you get from the sumo and get them from these instead because they're safer. Safety is the name of the game. In terms of legs, we're going to continue and we're going to talk about the biggest offender, which is the squat. A lot of tall guys, they have problems with deadlift, but they, they, they figure it out. They find a way around it. But in terms of squat, I find that this is the main issue because a lot of tall guys want to squat high bar. Same logic as with the deadlift. If you can get away with it, do it, but understand that you're not built for it. The longer your torso is, the tougher it's going to be to maintain a vertical portion on the torso. And that's not even mentioning the fact that your legs are gigantic. You have long legs. And therefore, the range of motion is much deeper than the average person. And on the squat, the deeper you go, the more the torso has a tendency to shift forward. So you have the deadly combo of a torso who is already not super rigid and a range of motion that forces you to go super forward. That is a recipe for lower back injury. As the tall guy, from the introduction I told you already, keep in mind, you're not like anyone else. You go through more range of motion. So for example, to go back to the idea of the block pull, when you do a block pull, you might do more range of motion than a smaller guy does on the conventional. It's highly possible. So don't be ashamed of it. The range of motion that you do suits your morphology. 
It's what you need to follow, not what someone else does. Because at the end of the day, again, you might lift the boar a longer distance than he does. Same for the squat. I'm going to advise you, if you want to stick to low bar, to not go as to grass. Because most likely, there is a portion around parallel where your hips shift underneath you, and that's when the lumbar spine rounds terribly. The butt wink. Some people say it's not dangerous. If you look at the way the, the spine is shaped, it, it adds extra stress to the area, and it's not needed. You can get away with doing a parallel squat. It's not the, the end of the wood. So do that. And then, in my opinion, the ultimate way to squat for someone who is tall is going to be low bar. And the reason is actually quite interesting. Because low bar involves more posterior chain. Because you're more bent forward, so you're in a deeper hip hinge position. And so naturally, some people would say, okay, but... Doesn't that involve more lumbar spine? Is it, isn't it what we want to avoid? Actually, no. If you, can, if you refer to the injury prevention playlist, I made a video about using the lower back as a bridge. A bridge can be like this, it can be like this, it can be like this. As long as it's stationary, it's strong. It's when it's moving that it becomes dangerous. Same for the lower back. The lower back can have different angles. As long as it's not the main mover, it's not in motion to pull the weight or resist the weight, you're fine. So whether you do a high bar with a back like this or a low bar with a back like this doesn't change anything. But if in the high bar you do this, and then when you descend the back does this, this is bad. Even if you started here, who cares if you started here? What matters is the flexion that happens at the bottom. If you start low bar and you do this, that's perfect. There is no flexion of the lower back. So you're going to be fine. It's going to be protected. And this is why low bar works. You're going to enter a position where you're already bend forward, which is what your torso naturally wants to do. Plus, the bar is lower than your back, so it doesn't have the ability to topple you forward. This is going to lead to a proper lower body experience, where you actually use the legs to move, not the lower back, not the upper back. The legs, they, they take the negative in and then they push up. And to me, that's how you grow big legs. And since you have long legs, it's going to be super crucial that you actually do it. So give low bar a try, a serious try. The technique you will find is not as comfortable as the high bar. It's not as natural, quote unquote. But once you master it, it's going to be, you're going to regret not having done it sooner. And a little tip, if you have trouble with the elbow mobility, shoulder mobility, I encourage you to do a false grip or you don't wrap the thumb around. Because you will find that because you're more leaned forward, the bar is more secure on your back. So that's the advice. And same as with the sumo, you can use the low bar as your main mover, but you don't have to do the style of the low bar all the time. You can do high bar post squat to parallel, because that way you can prevent the rounding from happening. You can do front squats if you want. Front squats might become your best friend. You can do SSB squat. Do not try to get all of your volume and tonnage from these main lifts. And I know it can be a little bit counterintuitive, because in the previous video, I clearly told you that Tall men need to do compounds. You need to accumulate tonnage with the most effective lifts. But that doesn't mean that you need to kill yourself on it. You need to find ways to accumulate that tonnage safely. And that, the way I just exposed it, is going to load that. Because keep in mind that the, you're not playing that hypertrophy game in terms of weeks or months. It's years. So a technique that is going to allow you to squat for five years is more beneficial than, than one that allows you to, to squat for only one year. And so, because in terms of tonnage, of course, five years is always going to be better. And so, all of the invest, investment you're going to put towards those practices is worth it. So that's for the low body lifts. Now, let's talk upper body. Upper body, you shouldn't have as many problems with the presses, for example, but I'm still going to give you some advice, some quick advice. First, don't be afraid to widen, as I said, your grip on the bench. Don't put pinkies on the rings. I mean, that's what people like me do. Go wider if needed. You might find that it's more comfortable on the shoulders for you and you're stronger. Same for your red press. Don't be afraid of going wide. You're going to also find that same for the range of motion. Your range of motion, if you have long arms, is going to be long, which also means that there's going to be more shoulder flexion. Don't hesitate to modify where you touch the bar on your chest to reduce it. Don't hesitate to work on your arch. Same logic, your range of motion is related to who you are. 
And the best range of motion is the one you can repeat day in and day out without getting injured. By default, you have long arms. You're already doing more range of motion than anyone else on the bench. Don't be afraid to find the right portion to activate the chest muscle. For the press overhead, I, I would say it's one of the lifts where you're going to have the least problems, so don't be afraid of it. For the vertical pulls, for pull-ups, for example, and stuff like this, you're going to have more range of motion too, but I have found that tall guys tend to do really well on this. If you want more information, refer back to the video I made for how to do pull-ups safely for hypertrophy. That is, this, I think it's going to be uh, beneficial for you. And so if we look at the big family of lifts left, a lot of the other ones are going to be isolation movements. There are going to be things that you will need to do, of course, but can take a small step back for you. And what I mean by that is, since you need that intensity, since you need that accumulation of volume so badly, you are the type of person who is going to be able to do more compounds, those who are supposed to carry over to the smaller portions of the, of the muscles, like bench for the, the triceps, pull up uh, chin-ups for the biceps, etc., and complete it afterwards with the isolation in smaller portions. And the reason why is, it's going to always be better for you to get more diffuse tonnage for all of the body parts because you desperately need everything to grow because everything is so lanky and wide that there is space, there is ample space. And so strategies will have to be implemented for you to be able to make those two things happen together because you'll still have to do your isolation. And I think the best way for that is supersets. Supersets, isolation movements, whenever you can, with your variations of compounds. That is going to be a life saver. And it's, it might be a little bit taxing on the cardiovascular system at first, but you should be a way to get away with it. Because you'll find that muscles like the forearms, muscles like the shoulders, muscles like the triceps, all of these will require more than either only isolation or only compounds, especially for you, because your arms are going to take a long time before they look impressive. But once they do, they're going to be very impressive. So that's mainly for the practical things. And uh, I think that, that, so, that sort of wraps it up. If you have any other question for things that you can do, if you have any advice because you yourself are tall and you want to give advice to all the tall men, please do it in the comments. And now we're going to move on to the end of the theoretical aspect, the end of the mindset thing. In terms of strength, you are going to be on average more uh, heavier than a normal person, which means your absolute strength is also going to be greater because it's also correlated with how big your structure is. This means that you really need to be afraid and you need to be very wary of trying to compare your strength to others because you're typically the type of person who's going to say, oh, but I bench this and he benches the same and he looks twice my size. Well, it's because of his segments and of his leverages you might have better leverages for certain lifts. You might have better absolute strength, but it doesn't correlate to muscle size. You need to disregard that entirely. You are an outlier and your progress is also going to fall into that category. It's going to take the time it takes. You might get to a 500 pound squat before your legs start looking impressive. It's possible. Meanwhile, some guys have a three plate squat, they have massive legs. It's a case by case thing, but you're typically the type of person who has immense strength potential as long as you stay injury free and you find your style. And therefore, you're going to make up your own standards. And it goes for strength, it goes for hypertrophy. Because as your strength grows and as your tonnage progresses, your muscles and your size are going to progress as well. And you're going to usher in an era of bodybuilding that we haven't seen yet. Meaning that we've seen monsters jacked up on hormones, step on stage at 6'6". But we don't really have examples of very tall nationals who've managed it. And the reason why is it takes a very long time. And for you, it's the game is rigged against you in a sense because it takes you a long time. You're more prone to injury. And on top of that, you're getting advice from people who are going to get you injured. And adding patience to the mix, you're going to rush things. Look at the hypertrophy series. Look at the programming advice I gave it doubly applies to you. The accumulation of tonnage safely implemented within relevant intensity windows is what is going to get you big over time. Strength progression is going to be a part of it because it's going to raise the amount of tonnage you can accumulate during the same amount of time during the session. 
but it's not going to be what is going to save you. Starting to do one rep maxes all the time is not going to make you big magically. Don't fall for that trap. Don't fall for the trap of thinking that your strength is going to immediately correlate to size. It's not going to work like this. Size will come from hypertrophy work. And that is what I'm going to end this video on. Again, thank you for watching. If you're tall, let me know in the comments. Uh, last time, I think the champion, the person who won, was 6'11". So if we have someone who's 7 feet, you will be crowned king of the giants on this channel. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.